guys, what the heck is up? This episode is not brought to you by Skillshare, uh, but it is brought to you with love by Robert and I. Uh, I'm Tyler. Good to good to have you here. Tyler. Robert. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we we do a little podcast, which you probably are aware of if you're listening to our podcast, because uh, that's how life works. But today, it's not just the two of us. Uh, we are actually joined by a friend. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, what's up, guys? Good to be on the podcast. Uh, Who my are you? <laughs> Nathan Wright. I was just not going to say my name. I was say just going to start talking. Say my name when no one is around you. <laughs> say baby. Mm. Yeah. Mm. No. So Nathan, <laughs> what are you here to talk to us about? So today, I wanted to talk about a little bit of what I've been learning um, through actually my minor here at school. I'm a finance major. Uh, but my minor is in philosophy, politics, and economics, which is all one thing. It's like a interdisciplinary, they like to say. I like mm-hmm. to throw that buzzword around. Got you. Interdisciplinary, uh, major and minor, actually, but I'm in the minor portion of it. Yeah. Um, and what we've been talking about lately is uh, rational choice theory um, and how that connects with behavioral economics. Uh, there's recently a um, professor from Duke who has a PhD in all, all sorts of things. Uh, he came here to talk, talk about behavioral economics, a lot of the experiments uh, they've been working through, and just really fascinating stuff that relates to um, how we think and the decisions that we make mm-hmm. um, and things like that. So that's been interesting to me lately, and so I thought we'd talk about it today. Cool. So before we get into that too much, we have a, a little classic segment on this show called mm. uh, Rapid Fire, where we, we, <laughs> the yeah, where yeah. we ask you questions. We have a low, low <laughs> production to, uh, budget, yeah, budget right. here. You have to quickly respond to them. So right. Robert and I are just going to bounce back and forth. I'll ask a question, I'll ask you a question. Yeah, but, you know. Uh, these aren't prepared, so we're just going to hit you with Let's questions. Let's do it. Freestyle. Are you ready? Yep, I'm ready. Electric or acoustic? Acoustic. Uh, never wear flannel again or never wear plaid again? Never wear plaid again. Never wear socks again or never wear shoes again? Never wear socks again. Twinkies or ho-hos? Twinkies all day. Drums or flats? Flats. A New Balance or Nike? New Balance. Um, shirts or pants? Pants. Hair up, hair down? Hair down. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Uh, eggs <laughs> or bacon? I'm gonna go eggs. If you had to punch one of us in the face, <laughs> probably Robert. <laughs> Robert does punch. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I have a question after that one. That'll end up. <laughs> that was a good session. Yeah. That, that'll do it. Good segment. <clears throat> well, like you <laughs> had kind of mentioned, we have you on to talk a little bit about like rational choice theory and behavioral economics, and those are a lot of big words. But for those of you listening, Rational choice theory is really what you're taught in Econ 101 that, you know, we as humans will act in our best interest and that a lot of our financial models are based on that assumption. Uh, But you're here to tell us a little bit about why that's not true. And do you want to get us started with an (laughs) example? Do you want to give us an example (laughs) of uh, such a thing? Yeah, yeah. A little more, a little more background on it, just to clarify. So, rational choice theory kind of came about seventeenth, mid seventeenth century with Thomas Hobbes. You might know him from the Leviathan and uh, Calvin and uh, Calvin and Hobbes. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) that was good. I. mm. He's, he's, the, he's the tiger, right? That's right, he's the tiger. Um, but so he, he wrote this book called The Leviathan, a uh, big deal in the history of economics, and he kind of came up with the idea of instrumental rationality, um, which is essentially that our decisions are rational if they work us towards our goals and are based on kind of sound motivation mm-hmm. for those goals. Um, but then behavioral economics kind of looks at this classical economics where, where everyone's making rational decisions and models are built on rational decisions, um, and it kind of takes the cognitive psychology side of things and says, well, not really. You know, mm. we don't always make decisions in our best interest. Sometimes out of sheer ignorance, sometimes yeah. because we really think we're making the rational decision, uh, but we're not. Sometimes we don't have information. Um, so if you think of, you know, think of a Venn diagram, this is how I like to think of it, mm-hmm. with cognitive psychology on the right and classical economics on the left. And behavioral economics is kind of where those two What's a Venn diagram? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Unfortunately, we don't have time. For this part of but um, some examples of that. So um, Dan Ariely, 
was giving some examples, some interesting kind of practical examples for us. Mm. Um, so we said they found... And Dan Ariely, for those of you who don't know, is mm-hmm. a Duke professor who recently came through uh, Virginia Tech and did an event with free beer and talked about uh, right. behavioral no- economics and how this kind of, uh, you know, led to this conversation. So. Yeah. Also, speaking of Duke at Virginia Tech, how about some Hokies? <laughs> hey! <laughs> hey! Let's go. Um, There's our news review. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So he was a very fascinating guy. Lots of TED Talks Dan really has, so look those mm-hmm. up. Millions of views. Really cool dude. We um, should get TED on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah, um. really. But um, so anyway, some of the examples he was talking about. So one of the things they found is that people in general, we want to make you know healthy decisions. We want to like, mm-hmm. eat better, things like that. Uh, but what we do is we end up putting all of our produce, our vegetables and fruits, in that like bottom drawer of the fridge, like that crisper, crisper drawer, you know, <laughs> yeah. humidity controlled and all that, which is a great, you know, engineering accomplishment makes a lot of sense. But what ends up happening is there's a lot of there's a lot of friction between kind of what we want to do, which is eat healthy, uh, and what we actually do. And the friction mm. involved in this scenario is having to like bend down, open the drawer, and access those healthier foods. That are kind of inconvenient to get to whereas you know we might have some unhealthier snacks on the higher level yeah so simple way to kind of deal with that just you know forget the crisper it's great and everything but forget it put the vegetables on the top shelf kind of eye level mm-hmm. and you're probably going to eat more of them because yeah, your monkey brain likes i see this exactly. i grab it, it I see it's this. shiny yeah <laughs> we're a little bit a little bit dumber than we think sometimes and that makes me feel great because over the past like couple of weeks, I've literally been keeping my mm. vegetables at eye level, <laughs> yeah. not because I was thinking about it because I'm lazy, but you know, I'm justified. Yeah. Robert is right. a perfectly rational human. The most rational human there's ever been. <laughs> and very punchable for those same reasons. And very, <laughs> right. right. <laughs> but another, another cool example that's kind of relatable, especially for college students, I would say, um, and even non-college Robert. students. <laughs> <laughs> is the idea of um, so like subscription services like so I'll ask you guys like do you guys have any experience with subscribing to something that's like a monthly kind of payment and it I just you coming. kind of forget about it you want to unsubscribe you kind right. of forget you, about you it you wanted one thing you something. oh yeah that's Amazon Music for me right mm. now is so that not included with Prime? there's like a you can get the like a lot of songs for free Gotcha. But then if you, like, fork out a little bit more, you get every song for free. Oh. And so... Levels. I got hit with it. Yeah. I, uh... In like, October or so of last year, I, uh... So I was like, oh, Saba's putting out Care For Me on vinyl. That's my favorite album this year. I'm gonna do that. Mm-hmm. But it was through Vinyl Me Please, which is this, like subscription where they'll send you a record every month uh, yeah. but they're always like really cool records really really fun time but I was like okay cool I'll do this there's no commitment so I'll do this and then in like three days I'll cancel it and it's still cheaper than just ordering it straight from his website by like three dollars and I was like alright yeah. cool not bad so I do that and then a month later I get an email it's like hey your uh, package is shipped and I was like wait a second <laughs> what package <laughs> <laughs> but so now I accidentally own a copy of Rico Nasty's Nasty on vinyl on like blue vinyl it's a really cool thing like I'm really glad I have it but mm-hmm. I would not have purchased it otherwise so really yeah. by acting irrational- irrationally I had self gain right yeah but in other circumstances <laughs> the Tyler Blankenship story I think I I think I had a Club Penguin membership for like Ooh. six months to a year after stopping playing Club Penguin in middle school That's so a throwback oh god I miss I was a mem- I had a membership I was, I was flexing game. out there you were so flexing I was jealous of this kid. I, had I like was like eight puffles yeah like... I was on the free version this whole time yeah I, I had a membership I don't like to uh, I don't like to flex on y'all too much but gosh <laughs> but that's a good that's the Skillshare money yeah <laughs> this is a good example because what what I remember I ended up having an audible subscription for six months too long that How was many books did you devastating get? for me I didn't get I got like two like that whole time I got two Ooh. it was it hurt it really hurt that's rough but man. I remember multiple times thinking oh yeah I have this audible subscription I need to cancel that but what I didn't want to do is cancel it tonight. Today. <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to yeah. cancel it that day. And then the next day came around, didn't want to cancel it that day either. So there was a lot of friction, a lot of you know time costs that went into, and they make it really hard sometimes. Oh yeah, they to bury it. To unsubscribe, to cancel, uh, things like that. I still get some emails that I'm like, I should cancel this, yeah. and I just don't. And you just don't because <laughs> you don't want to do it right here now. Um, and so these are things, these are you know frictions that exist between what we want to do and what we actually end up doing. Mm. And that is that friction is where behavioral economics lives. 
and what behavioral economics tries to, uh, well, you know, improve and enhance yeah. their decision making through that. Gotcha. So Nathan, in your show prep, um, you had mentioned this kind of this idea of free lunches, and and right now we've kind of defined what we're talking about, and we've done some work to give examples. But one of these take-home things is that this idea of a free lunch. So would you explain that to us? Yeah, so free lunch is something in, in classical economics. And even behavioral economics, people would say there's no such thing. Um, you know, you've heard the term, like, no such thing as free lunch. Um, and it's deserved, and to define that a little bit, it's not talking exclusively about monetary uh, free lunches. So say they're giving out free samples of, uh, you know, candy when you're walking like on campus or on the drill field or something. Gotcha. Um, you can, you know, that's free monetarily. You're not going to pay for that, yeah. but you're going to pay with your time. You're going to pay with going over there, picking it up. You might Talking get into a conversation. Ugh, yeah. that's not cool. You might um, take a more time. I know. Someone paid Some for the candy, obviously. Someone paid for the candy. There's always hidden costs behind what you're doing. And yeah. the health. I mean, talk about the health behind eating yeah. candy. Um, so that's the idea of, of no free lunches. Uh, but something that Dan Ariely talks about is the idea that free lunches can exist in the sense that since we know we do make systematically irrational decisions kind of across the board, right. um, we can achieve more efficiency, um, kind of pick up the slack, if you will, of systematic irrationality um, and achieve in that sense a free lunch for everybody. And a free lunch essentially in that sense is the costs um, are going to be far less than the benefits to everyone who's involved with it. Mm -hmm. So, do you have any good examples to kind of illustrate an example of like a free lunch situation? Yeah, there's a funny story he told. Um, he's a professor at Duke, I think I've already mentioned, and so he um, had a couple of entrepreneurs come to his office one day, and they're like, "Dan, like we want to start an insurance company," and they were like, "Can you join us? Like, do you want to be a part of our team?" And he was like, no, I don't want to, why would I get involved in insurance? Like, I have a dope gig here. Like, why would I do that? Um, but then he thought about it for a little bit. And he was like, you know what? I'll take you up on this. If you can create an insurance company that gets rid of the conflicts of interest. Um, conflicts of interest in insurance world um, is essentially, you know, we pay the insurance companies to kind of cover us if something bad goes wrong. Um, the insurance company gets that money. And they once they have the money, they don't want to use it pay it out for claims that we make. Um, so they put a lot of work in and like investigating the claims and saying, do you really need this money? Um, so there's this kind of conflict of interest. There's this pull in the money both ways. So we end up, you know, exaggerating these claims uh, because we know that they don't want to pay us, things like that. Um, so what they devised, um, and they call this company Lemonade. I believe it's still a company, an insurance company today, started in New York. Um, what they devised is they essentially set up kind of two funds for this insurance company. So one fund uh, goes directly to the company themselves, and that's 10% of the insurance money that's coming from the customers. 10%, they get it, that's mm -hmm. theirs, they pay their employees, whatever they want to with it. Uh, the rest of the money goes in to a fund uh, that pays out the claims. So that is a fund that none of the money is ever going to get to the company. So if a claim comes in, the insurance company pays it, they don't have a problem with it. That conflict's mm -hmm. kind of gone. And even more so, to kind of mitigate the conflict on the customer side, um, any money that's left over in that fund at the end of the year goes to a charity of their choice. So it's in their interest uh, to not exaggerate claims, to not get insurance claims for um, things that don't actually happen or they don't need. Because if they do, then it's hurting the charity that they mm -hmm. want the money to go to. And they actually had, um, I had a friend telling me about this same guy earlier today. They actually found that people... If they got like a dent in their car and it got fixed through insurance and let's say the insurance sent them too much money and they got cheaper, they would actually send the money back. So that would go to the charity and kind of like you're saying, creating this, you know, free lunch out of everyone, the, you know, the company got what it needed to f keep the lights on. The people got what they needed to fix their car and the charity got this like leftover because everyone got to this point of, you know, in economics 101, they talk about getting to like zero, right? Yeah, you want right. you want this like perfect, perfect capitalism would lead you to like this zero point where you're making as much money as you spend and, and that's like economic zero, not like... Equilibrium. Equilibrium, right. yeah. Um, which reminds me a lot of like some stuff, a, a YouTube channel my, I'm into called C CGP Grey mm -hmm. is like, you know, talk about, you know, one, another such example of free lunches in terms of time, right? We can think about... Or irrational is like how we board planes, right? You know, I saw that. we're, you know, 
we all will go back to front because it seems like a good idea, but it's like dumb. And, you know, I'm a systems <laughs> engineer, so this is what we study is like the most, the most best. Most yeah, best. I'm an engineer. I talk well. Right. Um, best ways to think. And oftentimes, you know, it would be better for everyone, but everyone just so like thinks like I, can, I need to get on the plane. I need to get on the plane. I need to get on the plane that it ruins it and the system just can't exist because people get mad that it seems slower and that sort of thing. Right, people would rather have one foot inside the cabin of the airplane and mm -hmm. be standing for 20 minutes than wait outside for six minutes and then go get their seat. Like, yeah. there's just that, that illusion of progress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. people, like, convenience and just, like, feeling like you're doing something, I feel like it's a lot more important yeah, and it's actually like, doing something in, in your best interest. We'll right? add to that. Sorry, this may be off topic, no, but that it. feeling like you're doing something is like the social media activism of like getting on a plane, right? You feel like you're doing <laughs> something, but you're really just, you know, maybe not slowing things down. I, I wouldn't go that far, but like... You're not really doing anything. Yet. You're not really right. doing anything. So the, continuing to uh, keep this as a music podcast <laughs> Yeah. Um, on the new... Phoebe Bridgers, Connor Oberst, uh, Better Oblivion Community Center record. There's a song where one of the first ones is like, uh, I didn't know what I was in for when I signed up for that run. There's no way I'm curing cancer, but I'll sweat it out. I feel so proud now for all the good I've done. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, I didn't really, at the end of the song, it's like, and I realized I haven't never really done anything for anyone. <laughs> it's like, well, sure. but, but then maybe that's a free lunch, right? Because, you know, everyone got there. They got to be healthier. That's good. I got to be healthier for a good cause. Like, mm. you know, money does go help cure cancer and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And maybe it wasn't like the biggest vendetta ever. They didn't do the nicest thing. But it's everyone getting together on a free lunch. So maybe that's a good thing. And the people feel good about it and we get a good album. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Like, and, and like, we even get a good album out of the comedy of making fun of 5K runners. So Absolutely. Like, so, you know, this idea of, I think maybe if we had a take home... Maybe it's this idea of, like, look for the free lunches that exist, right? Yeah. You know, those sorts of things. And, you know, they're not always easily identifiable, but some some things definitely are. Um, yep. I think that's... I'm feeling good, guys. I'm I know. It's a positive. Good. It's a good thing. It's a young... As I said before, it's kind of a young field. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of young economists are, are kind of into it. Whereas yeah. the older economists are into like the more traditional economics, right. yeah. Um, so I can see where this is going. It might, uh, you know, yield a lot of positive results in the future. So. And then you'll have some economist hipsters like go back to like, the roots, <laughs> yeah. Soon enough, they'll they'll go back There's to that. Real roots and economy. Like, this is <laughs> real economics. <laughs> this is real economics. That's right. None of that. It's a hard science. <laughs> Not, it's a hard science. Yep. Um, so going from speaking conceptually of free lunches to a more. Uh, restaurant tailored specific like lunches thing mm, you were like talking a literal a bit, yeah you, you had kind of a literal example yeah. you were talking about yep that's not not really a free lunch but more just kind of back into rational choice yeah mm -hmm. um do you want to kind of explain that yeah it gets into a more like a personal decision uh that we can make and that even you know the restaurants that are serving us can make so they did a study um it was actually at I don't believe UNC Chapel Hill is when they did the study. That's where Ariely got his PhD in cognitive psychology. Mm -hmm. um, so he did the study. He was at a brewery with a friend, uh, and they noticed how people ordered their drinks. Mm -hmm. um, so often, if you're in a group of like two or three people, kind of noticed that they would order different drinks, mm -hmm. and they wondered if that's really what they wanted to do, or if they were doing it for maybe other reasons like mm -hmm. uniqueness or wanting to try something new, something like that. Yeah. So they divided devised an experiment uh, where they would give out free beer samples and have one group kind of announce publicly what they were going to order. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a group of three to five people. Publicly what they were going to order, and then another group would write down what they were going to order privately and mm -hmm. hand it to who was serving them. Um, and so they found that the, that the participants who ordered publicly, and this was unknowing, obviously, it was mm -hmm. all low-key, um, publicly ordering the people who ordered after the first person would often order something different. Uh, and then the person after that would often order something different. Um, and this could be either because, you know, maybe they wanted to try something different or they wanted to feel unique, yeah. uh, kind of like special and like try something different. Or probably that not sense. that they want to feel unique, but more that they just didn't want to think that other people think they're ununique. Right. Yeah. The um, social pressure behind it. Yeah. For sure. And so, and then they ended up, um, at the end of this, after they had their samples, they kind of got feedback for how satisfied they were with their choice. 
And so uh, long study short, they essentially found that people who ordered silently, uh, ordered on the piece of paper, handed it to who was serving them, were more satisfied with their choice. Oftentimes people ordered the same drink, uh, but that was okay for them. They were more satisfied uh, when they did it privately and not publicly, and they didn't change their order based on what other people got. Um, so you can obviously apply this directly to restaurants. Uh, when you're ordering, uh, you know, practically from the results of this study, you know, figure out what you're going to order before you talk to people about it, mm -hmm. before the waiter or waitress comes. Um, figure out what it is. Maybe announce it to the table yeah. if you're if you're self interested enough, you know, to do that. And so persuade others. <laughs> persuade others to maybe like do something else, but you're gonna stick with what you want, and you'll be more satisfied. You're gonna like the restaurant better. I mean, it's kind of a very practical free lunch. Well, I can actually tell you, so you'd be happy. There's a taco place in Nashville that I went mm. to that actually implements this system. So they have they don't have a waiter take your orders. There's cards on the table and you like each person will like circle in what they want. Okay. And then when you're done, you put those cards in a little like, you know, like uh, thing that displays them, not like super loudly, but then they know you're done with their order. They'll come in, they'll tell you about all this stuff. Okay. But it also takes away that weird pressure of like the waiter's always checking up on you. Yeah, and, like, oh no, another minute. Yeah. It was like the chillest And then thing. you say another minute one more time, they wait like 18 minutes yeah. to come back to your table. Yes. <laughs> it's like this table needs its time. That's a very real phenomenon. Right. Yeah. Definitely. But you know, it's it's changing the world, people. Get in the behavioral economics That's right. train right now. That's right. So we can jump off it later and call everybody like, you know, bandwagoners. Get some free lunches. It was like yeah. the opposite of like the money hall problem where like your best interest is to stick to your gut. Yeah, no yeah exactly. What. Exactly. Social pressure, social pressure and not having complete information mm -hmm. are kind of the two ways that rationality can break down mm. the most is what we find. So yeah, very complex topic, but kind of a hopeful outlook for things. Well, there we go. Well, I just realized the money hall problem being brought up is our like fourth game show aside of this. Oh, that's true. <laughs> that is our fourth game show aside. Do that's we right. episode? Uh, we can all agree that Let's Make a Deal is at the bottom of the pile as far as all those game shows are concerned. I'm, I'm okay with that. We can agree with that. Yeah. Okay. So it does. It is an interesting statistical problem, but it is. it's not an interesting <laughs> I would say it's a show. mathematical. Well, I guess it is. It's, it's you kind can of statistics, statistics of what, what's I, the I, we, we covered it in a statistics course, so I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll let, I'll let it It's the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is the same thing. It's just math. Um, well, with that... You guys have some hot takes this week that we need, we best get to, 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 to keep with the show's well. name. So, Nathan, yours was pretty fiery, so you want to hit us with it? Yeah, pretty pretty spicy hot take over here. So I was talking with some buddies uh, the other day about social media. Like, it's a cool thing to take, like, social media fast and, like, breaks from things nowadays, yeah. you know. It's real hip. <laughs> it's real hip and stuff. I've done it, you know, right, personally. Right. It's been fun. Um, but I found that in, you know, taking a break from certain social medias, things like that, um, honestly, like, I think Facebook is still the best social media. That is very, that's spicy for our age of people. It is. In the I, age of Snapchat and Twitter and Instagram. I would have to agree in that I think Facebook is the most useful. Mm. Like, it is the best event. Like, it keeps me updated on, like, things that are happening. Like, life events. Life right. events, other people. You know, I'm a little bit annoyed by, like, continuous flush of, like, engagement photos for people who oh, aren't actually sure. engaged. Um, <laughs> and, you know, everyone's, like, third birthday or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I like that it's text and photos and links. Yeah. That makes it easy. Messaging people who, like, you don't have their numbers. That's or, like, you true. want to text them. I think it's super useful. Now, Tyler. So my hot take <laughs> is that Twitter is the only truly social Ooh. media. Ooh. Okay. So, so he that, was scared to challenge Facebook as the most oh, useful. Oh, no. It's, it's by far the best and most useful, too. But yeah, we can agree. Uh, right. <laughs> My thoughts on Facebook, as someone who's never had Facebook, mm. so take that with a, yeah, a, little, bias. a little spoonful of salt to sure. let this medicine go down. Um, <laughs> Facebook, to me, has always seemed, or not not always, but since parents kind of got on, it's yeah, less yeah. of a social thing and more of a, 
kind of closed off like here's an event that's happening here's a major life thing mm -hmm. but it's not really social you're not really not as fluid having things go the way that twitter is just like here's an idea let's talk about it here's the here's something happening in the world we're all talking about it at once Let, let's talk what? about it meaning i have this hot take and let's <laughs> like and i'm just gonna yell it over a hundred right, but then someone's polarized. gonna yell you're the dumbest person i've ever seen yes yeah. here's why yeah um and Dude, that totally took me off my train of thought. But, <laughs> and then you have like your Instagram, which is just like kind of your curated, here's what I look like. Yeah. Or not here, here's what here's I look like. Here's what I want you to see about my life. Exactly. Yeah. Um, whereas Twitter, I think a big thing in it is that its focus is more on ideas rather than people. Hmm. So Instagram, if I'm scrolling through Instagram, I'm a lot more likely to like a picture if my friend posted it. Yeah. Than if it's a good picture. Like I'm not mm -hmm. actively searching out pictures. I like looking at, I'm actively supporting my friends. Yeah. Um, whereas on Twitter or something like, I don't care who you are. Like if you tweet something really funny, that's going to get my support. Mm -hmm. Um, also Twitter has the weird accessibility where like you can just talk to people that you will never meet in a way that you, Facebook seems too close. Like, Oh, mm -hmm. I added it's you very much Facebook about your friend, network, your world versus I, I added you on Twitter. Like I follow yeah. you on Twitter. Like, I was DMing a rapper I really like today, just chatting, yeah. which would never have happened on Facebook. Um, so, to, to me, I would say it's the only so, truly social media left. You could argue Snapchat, but I think Snapchat leaves you in the same kind of, this is my bubble. circle, it stays as an echo chamber. Yeah, I can see that. It is more of a um, bubble thing. Also, to the point of the argument of Twitter just being better, Facebook is stealing so much more of your data and doing so much more. Oh, I was actually going to mention that. Yeah, that's very Facebook true. has yeah. the most aggressive algorithms yeah. Yeah. that are out there for sending you content that you have reacted to. Right. Whether po like, I mean, positively, of course, but they're going to very much spam that to the point of like, if you have a friend that you skipped over their picture they posted once your likelihood to see something they post again is really, really low. Yeah. Um, so it, it's kind of, Facebook is very, very aggressive. Not to say the other ones aren't aggressive, but like very aggressive. This is a little bit off topic, but yeah. kind of falls under rational choice. How do you guys feel about the kind of universal switch from companies to algorithmic based uh, timelines or news feeds or dashboards or whatever you call it on your given social media network? But the very strong kind of consensus that you see of users wanting just a chronological thing. Do you think users actually want chronological or developers found that they say they want chronological, but they're engaging more with algorithmic? Depends on the platform. I'd say for YouTube, I love... YouTube algorithm is one of the few good algorithms. Well, it's getting worse. That's fair. Spotify is pretty solid too. YouTube, at YouTube this week had got in big trouble because of a child pornography case because their algorithm oh, yikes. was promoting people who are watching certain videos would get recommended more videos that would go deeper and deeper into these holes. Right. So gotcha. Google stock actually dropped a whole percentage this week wow. because I of that. About that. Um, now, with that said... I have enjoyed YouTube algor YouTube's algorithm amazingly, and it has been especially helpful in finding music that I like. Mm -hmm. So I think for those things, I think people love the Spotify algorithm, and I think they would m admit that. I think people actually like it, what people like. I think people would say they might they they maybe enjoy the algorithm view better, and if they were just asked dry, like you you see like side by side, you see like the just timeline one versus you know the algorithm one they might choose the algorithm one because like oh i like this one better yeah initially but i think the implications of the algorithm run one right are have more negative effect that people are picking that's kind of how i see it yeah because like now i don't see my friends things on instagram necessarily like yeah, I'll, that's true. I'll start someone will be like six days ago. I'm like, wait, what? Now I'm liking this yeah. six day old picture. I think I think you have to. Yeah. I think you have to see them as two categories. Of one, you have the YouTube and the Spotify as suggesting yeah. media for you that yeah. you don't have much personal attachment to. Right. Whereas the other ones are more pure social media. They're more. Where it's more personal. It's right. more social. You you don't want to miss you know the thing that your sister posted. Maybe she never posts, but. 
she posted it and you want to see that yeah. um and you might want to see it chronologically as opposed to where youtube's like feeding your interest right. more i don't care when a youtube spotify. video was posted yeah i don't exactly. care when a song was put on spotify yeah you have less Nearly as much bias as i care about it. the quality especially if if you're someone who posts things that like maybe are important but people kind of skim over mm. you know if if that algorithm data is saying okay you should they they skim over this yeah they're going to skim over maybe a more rational take on a political issue because no one wants to read that much because as we've learned if the vegetables are in the bottom drawer we don't eat them mm. right. full um, circle we don't eat them but you know but that causes them to get looked over so we get this amplification of simplified ideas into like i can take down your entire theology with one tweet right like i think that's really stupid but like uh, 10 times that jordan peterson totally <laughs> owns the yeah I mean, <laughs> yeah we all know the one yeah and so but i think that's just bad dialogue and i think that's perpetuated by our, our news media now which is just trying to get more clicks because they're dying right because traditional news media is like we either need to resurrect it or it's dying. Um, which leads into, you know, kind of a point that if you're interested in a follow-up to this, and this can be my suggestion for this week, is uh, Crash Course, who helped all of you through, you know, AP Chem or, <laughs> you know, physics or whatever you take on Crash Course, is actually doing a course right now on navigating digital information, which is what they would call a fact-checking course and how to check your news and stuff like that. And one inter interesting statistic they found is that, you know, if you ask people, like, if they're good at determining what's good news and what's bad news, and then, like, gave them false ads and real ads, the people who said they were not susceptible to, like, fake news were more susceptible to fake mm -hmm. news. Mm -hmm. um, the... And so I would, A, go check out that crash course. It's, it's some good stuff. And B, if you're not familiar, check out something like Snopes. Um, I think that's how you say it. It's a yeah. fact-checking yeah. site and things like that. Um, and don't judge a website by how it looks. <laughs> looks are the easiest thing to right. mimic. Um, so, yeah, I think that's just like kind of an interesting thing of navigating all this information in our, our kind of world right now. One interesting thing that doesn't directly relate, but kind of is another, you, it's, the way that people think it works is mm. counterintuitive to how it actually yeah. works. Mm. Is that a, I was reading this recently about how when the uh, first Apple iPod came out, mm -hmm. the shuffle function was random. Yes. Uh, but they got so many complaints that it wasn't yes, random. I that love that. Apple had to make an algorithm that was less random, <laughs> but made it feel yeah. more random. Yeah. Because if you think about a truly random sequence, you're going to have runs. Right. You're yeah. going to have three songs from the album play in your 800 song yeah. playlist. Yeah. You know? But they, they really focused on making an algorithm that would spread it out so that it felt more random despite yeah. actually being less random. Yeah. So I've been playing, um, I've been playing Rummy, the card game, mm -hmm. with my roommate a lot lately. It's kind of our new thing. You guys are such um, old people. We're such Rummy's old people. Great. Sometimes Rummy we drink. Is a fun sometimes game. we drink tea when we do it. Yeah. Uh, so talk about the news. I'm drinking tea right now. So. Yeah. It's a good tea day. But uh, so we've been playing Rummy, and it's fascinating to us the hands that are given to us. Sometimes we shuffle yeah. a few times. It's seven cards each person. You pick yeah. up your hand, and it's amazing how frequently you'll get like three of the same face card. Yeah. Or you'll get a hand with like two aces, right. and so if you if you thought there was a company behind that who like right. created some sort of like shuffle yeah. function for it, Ooh, I would blame good. them. You know, right? That is but statistically, so good. it's more like it's it's less likely for there to not be some kind of coincidence in your hand right. because you're gonna think there's a coincidence if you have a two three four or a four five six or yeah. a six seven eight or like there's so many different variations that. It's so much less likely for there to be none of them than for there to be one, even though that one seems so far from random to you. Oh, okay. I'm so excited right now. I'm like <laughs> fist pumping because this gets into the idea that humans are a storytelling animal, right? We don't understand the world. We're just extremely good at telling stories. And you can do, you can do studies. And what I mean by stories is like, you can give people any conclusion, like run any test and ask them why it happened. 
and people are just um, off the charts amazing at coming up with hypothetical reasons something happened mm. without any real data, but they can make the data conform to this yeah, idea they have. The big that's like kind of the idea of coincidence is in that if given a big enough data set, you can find an insane coincidence in anything because you wanted it to be there. Yeah. Like you it's more likely or it's less likely that there would be no coincidence in this huge mm -hmm. data set. Right. Than not. Yeah. So it would actually be more it would be less likely for there to not be coincidences. Yeah. And I want to get back to Nathan's point here because I thought it was so awesome is that if you kept getting kings and queens or your friend kept getting kings and queens and you thought there was a master shuffler out there, you would be rage mad at them. Yeah. Right. And this gets to the point where we're at now where I'm not sure if there's a mastermind behind like all the, like there are some masterminds, but I think a lot of people are just scared of the monster in the closet. Yeah when they meet actual people, but I, I don't know. But that's that's another topic. Yeah, but once you start looking at something like social media where the deck isn't shuffled as randomly, you right. start having your Cambridge Analytica's coming in. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you're not getting a random thing. That's when it starts to be yeah. a truly not random targeted thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Silicon Valley starts going to DC. Wow. So... What I think that's that? a pretty good note to end on. Yeah, that's a great yeah, note to end on. Solid. Well, Nathan, thank you so much for joining mm. uh, the pod today. Would you like to recommend anything to the people out there for... Uh, oh, yeah. Take before before I take like, try and intro away? you out. Uh, no, honestly, I'm going to recommend... Love an intro to an outro. <laughs> this is kind <laughs> of a switch up. It's not what I was thinking. But I'm just going to recommend the game Rummy. <laughs> what <laughs> if... Now are we playing Gin or We can. You or? can play Gin. You can play 300. My roommate and I, we're not playing Gin. We're just playing like Rummy Infinity, I guess you could call it, where we keep just calculating the score you keep and it that. just keeps that going. That is up. the shell to So, how does it end? Uh, it doesn't. It just, I guess it ends, it ends when I graduate <laughs> because oh. he has another year left. So, the game. The game doesn't it, stop. The game isn't one sitting. Exactly. So, the, you currently have a score, and tomorrow mm -hmm. night you'll pick it back up, same score. So, we'll play maybe three games a sitting. And then the next time, the score keeps running. Do the okay. scores kind of even out? Like some days, sometimes you have a really good day, sometimes you have a really <sighs> bad day, so they stay kind of close? Or do you get runaways? The amount of thinking we've done about this game, because we totally get runaways. How it started was my roommate, David, he didn't know how to play Rummy. If you don't know how to play Rummy, it's super easy to look it up. Um, yeah. It's worth it. But he didn't know how to play, so I had to teach him. Mm -hmm. So I taught him everything I know, right? We get into like a little bit of strategy. Right out the gate... I think it's like 480. I think he had 480 points okay. at the end of our first like few sessions, right? Mm -hmm. And I had like 250. It wasn't even close. Like that's right. an absurd, Blown out. staggering mm -hmm. blowout. You and I smashed. taught him. I got yeah. smashed. Beginner's luck. Beginner's luck, we could call it. Um, and he, at one point, to he make said... To sense in our brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah that's, the story. The story. <laughs> that's the story I told right. myself. I was yes. right. Beginner's luck. Um, and around the point, Sorry, he, was, <laughs> he was like, um, I think my luck might be running out. And then... Yeah, I was like, oh, yeah, you know, that's not a real thing, but okay, you know, cool thing to say. And then I took the lead, like, he within like the next him, yeah. few sessions. Um, so it's an interesting, you know, theoretical kind of experiment with what we're talking about. Interesting. Yeah. Do, you, do you know, like, how long has this game been going? It's been going um, since end of last week. Probably like oh okay so not super long so it's not super long now you guys have to carry it'd be it fun out to online. check check in yeah. in a year see how close your scores are whether it's a yeah. gap of five thousand or thirty because the long run probabilities would dictate it would be like 30. as n increases oh yeah you would you would you would narrow in and what upon his suggestion I'm totally inputting this data into Excel <laughs> and I'm gonna make charts I'm gonna make all the charts. I'm gonna run cool. some like R squared analysis. It's gonna be great. Wonderful. So, it'll be fun. Well, thank you. That was a that was a good recommendation. Yeah. Dude. What you got, Bobby? I think I had one coming in. Oh, I already gave mine. Mine is uh, go check out the crash course right, right, right. navigating oh, yeah. digital information. That's right. Um, and then I'm gonna go because what would this show be if I didn't recommend an album? Mm -hmm. um, Toro y Moi's uh, Outer Peace album. We played it a lot around the house here last week. Uh, just yeah. been there's a lot of fun grooves. Um, Understated vibes, vocals, man. just good vibes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so definitely enjoy that. Um, and then do you... We, we started kind of with a bad joke um, with our 
Buffalo Wild Brass, do you have any bad jokes that you'd like to share to the people out there? Bad joke for the people. Um, or good jokes, I guess. But Oh, there's the so there. many economist jokes. I hey, feel like I could make... an economist joke. You gotta do it. But I don't know any economist jokes. You don't know any economist no. jokes? I don't. That's not my that's not my lane enough, I guess. Wow. That's kind I of feel scary. bad. I should have I should have prepped that. That's something I definitely should have. So prepped, uh but. what did the uh scarecrow say when he was complaining about his job? I don't know. What did he say? Well so he he ended up starting to rationalize after his complaints and said, uh, <laughs> This job isn't for everyone, but hey, it's in my jeans. <laughs> ah. Because he's wearing jeans. And they're in it. Yeah, and they're yeah. hanging it. <laughs> Oh, wow. so they stuffed the scarecrow. All right, the well, in the jeans, get it? Cause, like it's funny because like it's a subversion <laughs> of expectation, which is the basis of comedy. Um, and with the longer you explain the joke, the funnier it gets. <laughs> That's true. You, you guys us, are laughing. You, you wanna play us out? <laughs> well, yeah, let's play. Let's play it out here. Let's play it out here. Also, feel free to hop in at any time during this ASMR experience oh, with your own ASMR. Yeah. Thank you for tuning into this uh, edition of the Hot Cakes Hot Takes Experience. Thank you, Nathan, for coming on the show. As the premier post pancake podcast, we pride ourselves on putting uh, prior preparation into each episode. Uh, we brought Nathan today. I thought it was going to be Nathan Falta. It was not. It's this Nathan. Talk to the people. I assumed there was going to be hot cakes at the Hot Cakes and Hot Takes podcast. There was, in fact, no hotcakes, but banana bread, which, honestly, (laughs) is a superior substitute. (laughs) We love y'all. See you next time. So much.